Welcome to Inspiring Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Ruth King. I am pleased, honored, and excited to introduce you to Colonel Lee Ellis, U.S. Air Force retired. Lee wrote an incredible book called Leading with Honor, and we're going to talk about leadership, both in small businesses, as a husband, as a wife. This book applies to your personal life as well as your business life. And here's what the book looks like. Lee, it is so great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ruth. Good to be here. And, you know, as we talked about what the book is all about, we, we looked at it from a perspective of it really and truly isn't only for a business owner. It really is leading with honor, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, a coach. I mean, you wrote the book, I think, for business people, though, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I did. But somehow I wanted to tell the story, and I hoped that the story would pull others in. And it really has. I've been amazed. Uh, some lady said, my 20-year-old daughter read that book over the weekend. And then I had a lady who's uh, just passed away, but last summer we were at a group uh, uh, together. And she said, I just read your book. She was 90 or 91 years old. said, I just read your book. I just wish I'd had it when I was in business. I enjoyed it so much. And mm -hmm. I think, wow, you know. Well, the thing is, enjoying it is one thing, but actually mm -hmm. applying the principles of the book yeah. is really what it's about. And see, that's what she said. If I had had that, those principles back when I was a business person uh -huh. in business, she said it would have really helped a lot. Right. And what's your definition of a leader? I think a leader is a person that influences others. And sometimes I can remember in the POW camp where I was a junior ranking person, I had influence, and I actually influenced my leaders at times. They influenced me most of the time, mm -hmm. but there were times when I influenced them, when I, when I thought something through and I knew what the wise thing was, and I would sit down and talk to them, and they would listen. Uh, and looking back, I knew that after the war, I never thought about it then, mm -hmm. but years later, I thought about it, and I realized that's what was going on, and some of them told me that. So I think it's about influence. Do you, are you able to get people to see the vision or to see things in a clear way that helps them move toward the goal? And we talk about leadership, and small, most small business owners don't think that, about leadership. You know, usually it's something with a Fortune 500 or, or very, very large mm -hmm. companies, but a small business owner can truly impact an organization. Oh, yeah. Leadership always makes a difference, always, good or bad. It can make a difference the wrong way or the positive way. Mm -hmm. And I challenge leaders to stop and think. I challenge everybody to stop and think, how are you influencing others? Are you actually putting some energy and time in thinking through how you're leading? Now, I did this this last week, just driving from one meeting to another, and I started thinking, I'm not doing a good enough job with my team. I need to spend a little more, invest a little bit more time in them and leading them uh, because they're working hard and we're all working hard, but I just, I'm not putting much back into them. So we can all get better. Well, that goes with the thing, I'm so busy working in the business that I can't work on the business. Right. And what would you say to a small business owner who always says, I don't have time for this? Well, I can tell you what the, the Rockefeller Habits book says. Okay. You know, Vernon Harnish <laughs> says, if, if you're spending all your time working in the business, you don't have a business, you have a job. Mm -hmm. So business leaders, all leaders, need to be able to elevate themselves up from just doing the work and start thinking more about the business. And the higher up you go in the organization, the more time you need to spend thinking about that from that higher level, thinking about what's happening, what needs to be happening, what could go wrong, how can we prepare for the next eventuality. All the time you need to be thinking about those and if you're always working, you're not spending enough time thinking more strategically. Right. And one of the things that I always hear is the word fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, leaders are afraid. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they still lead? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, uh, we have, I call it doubts. Okay. Doubts. We have doubts. That's really another way of saying fear because people don't, sometimes don't like to admit they have fear. We all have doubts and fears. We all have discomforts. I can tell you how to spot fear is when you start feeling uncomfortable and you start holding back or you're procrastinating doing something that you really need to do as a leader. 
that's because there's fear underneath there. You're afraid of what might happen if I confront that situation. They may not like me, or I might make a mistake, or I might step out too quickly. Or they Rather, might leave. Yeah, they might leave, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I really, one of my biggest messages is to leaders is you must confront your doubts and fears. And I say, take the courage challenge. Lean into the pain of your fear. Figure out what it is you need to do, and then come up with a plan and just start walking into it. Just start walking into it and doing the best you can. And that's probably the right way. That's going to be the best way you can go. The, the thing that I've always believed is that we're, the thing that we're most afraid of is the thing that will get us the most ahead once we confront that fear. Yes. Yes. The, the thing that we probably need to do the most is to confront that fear and deal mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. and move through it. Mm -hmm. uh, to engage it. Not not knee jerk, mm -hmm. you know. To get a good plan, like sometimes in a in a corporation or a business where they have an HR department, I say, you know, don't do a knee jerk. If you got a problem person, come up with a plan. Go talk to HR. Tell them what you're thinking. See what they're thinking, and that way it keeps you legal. And they can they've got experience to rely on. They can give you some ideas, and then you come up with your plan and you just go walk through it. Always caring about the person, mm -hmm. but being respectful. But tough love is a powerful thing, too. Right. And, and I also think that once we confront fear, sometimes it becomes easier, not necessarily more fun, but easier to do it a second it or third. It does get easier and easier and easier because you've worked your way through. Mm -hmm. And you may run into a bigger fear later, but you work your way through that one. I think that's what happened in the POW camps, mm -hmm. is that we learned to, to confront those fears, and each time it got a little easier to confront those doubts and fears and move ahead to do what we knew was right. And that was probably the worst experience in terms of what yeah. a leadership situation might oh, be. it was. It was. I was thankful not to be a leader. <laughs> those leader, Our leaders were fabulous. They suffered the most. They were tortured the most often and the most severely, and yet they bounced back and just came right back and set the example for us time and time again. And that's basically what you have to do as a leader or a small business owner who's yeah. leading a corporation. Yeah, because people are watching you mm -hmm. to see how are you going to perform, what are you going to do when the pressure's on and you have to make that hard decision. And if you show courage and do the right thing, and you, we all know what the right thing is, 99 times out of 100, mm -hmm. and you do the right thing, you set that example, they're going to try to live up to that when it comes their turn. Very good. Yeah. All right, when we get back from break, let's talk about the organization overall in terms of leadership. Thanks for watching Inspiring Entrepreneurs. I'm here and honored to have a conversation with Colonel Lee Ellis, United States Air Force, retired. And I want to read you a, a quote from his business cards. And if you would like a copy of this business card, just send us an email, and we'd be happy to send that to you. Obviously, you'll need to give us your address, too. But on the front side of the business card, he has the Courage Challenge Commitment. And it says this, and it's in the book also. Lean into the pain of your doubt and fears to do what you know is right, even when it doesn't feel natural or safe. And that came right out of the book, and I, and I noticed yeah. it as soon as, as soon yeah. it was on the card. But what do you use the card for? Well, we, it's, we call it the Courage Challenge card, actually. And mm -hmm. so we're trying to challenge people to, to think through when are they shrinking back out of fear rather than moving forward and engaging the situation and dealing with it in a positive, proactive way. Mm -hmm. Because what I found is that fear takes leaders out everywhere. I mean, you look at uh, some of the, the coach at Ohio State that was fired. In his press conference, he said, well, I didn't know I was afraid, and I didn't know who to talk to. Well, when you're afraid, you better know who to talk to, because that's the time you may need some good counsel. You may, may need some encouragement to, to move ahead and do the right thing. And you look at Penn State. You know, that was so much about fear. People were covering up. They were hovering back rather than step forward and deal with the issues. And uh, organizations that step forward rather than shrink in fear but step forward and deal with the issues think the issues kind of go away and melt away. Look at, remember the Tylenol That's scare? That's what I was just going to say, the Tylenol. Yeah, they stepped up and they said, yeah, mm -hmm. we got a problem. We're going to fix it. And, you know, their brand is a great brand today uh, after all those years. And it's funny because a lot of times the fear piece of it, once you confront it and deal with it, turns into a phenomenal thing for your company. Yes, yes, or exactly. You, or a person yeah, or an it's organization. It's turned out to be a positive story that mm -hmm. people have been telling for more than 20 years. Right. How they confronted it and dealt with it. There was a problem. It wasn't their problem, but someone was 
messing up their Tylenol. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they got them. Yeah. And, and I think it became a Harvard Business Review case, didn't it? I think it? so, I yeah. think it actually did. But it's the right thing to do. Stand up, even if you're afraid, and say, right. look, we screwed up. Right. Whatever else it is, and we're going to deal with that. Yeah. Let's talk through, in, and also, in the, if you get a copy of the book, the book, there is a bookmark that comes with the book, which is really cool, and it talks about the leadership principles. We talk about the first six, which are leading yourself and then mm -hmm. leading others, and I think the fear issue is the biggest one for leading for yourself yes, and, and getting through that. Is, are there mentors that people can go to? I mean, if somebody's really afraid, what's the best place for them to go, would you think? Well, I think the first thing they want is self-awareness. Okay. Okay, so you start to become aware of, what am I feeling here? What am I, where am I in this? What's going on inside me? And with that self-awareness, then you can, you're empowered to address it and make decisions. Okay, I'm actually backing away because I just don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But I should deal with it. Right. So... Now I need a plan. Maybe I need to, I have peers that I call mm -hmm. when I have a situation. Uh, I've gone to my bosses in the past at times when I had a situation that I wasn't sure how to deal with. Sometimes I know how to deal with it. And I just don't own. want to. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, though, it, situations are too emotional to be objective about. And that's mm -hmm. when you need outside help. Because mm -hmm. when you start drinking your own Kool-Aid too much, you, that's when you make some bad mistakes sometimes. So getting that outside perspective. I might go to someone and say, I'm thinking about doing this and this. What do you think? Is this past the test, mm -hmm. the smell test? Nah, that one's OK, but that one seems a little shaky to me. I think I'd do, I wouldn't do that. OK. OK, because I'm so emotionally caught up in it. I'm excited about it. I want to do it. But they can show me how that would not be in my best interest. So getting some good counsel there, I think, is, a, is really a big help. And that good counsel could come from somebody below you mm -hmm. as well as somebody above. Sometimes you people around you you trust that are wise, listen to them. Yeah. I think what you said was when we get emotional, we're not thinking rationally. That's quite often the case. And so we have to get back to the rational yes. with the help of others yes. to... Yeah. Get through a situation. Yeah. I mean, my wife can, I'm a very logical person, but when I get emotional about something, either with anger or joy, mm -hmm. I can go real high on either one of those okay. quickly. <laughs> then I turn to her sometimes and say, well, tell me, what do you think about this? Because she, in those cases, she'll be very rational because it's not something she's involved in. Unless okay. it was the time you asked her to marry you. Well, she, I hope that was emotional, too. <laughs> Not just rational, but she took me up. And that's been 40 years. Uh -huh, that's terrific. Almost yeah. be 40 years this year. So that's been, that has been a good decision that was rational and emotional for both of us. <laughs> yeah. But being rational and logical about things does help us make good decisions. But on the other hand, don't discount emotions. Emotions, okay. as a leader, are very powerful. Okay. And you want to tap into them because emotions are where all the... Uh, enthusiasm, the um, the motivation is really about emotion. So a person is when you're touching someone's emotions in a positive way, you're touching their deepest desires. And if you're touching them in a negative way, you're probably touching their deepest fears. Okay. So touching and in, in, in bringing people in and showing them why this is important to them and why it's valuable to them as well is a very powerful thing for leaders to do. So leaders shouldn't be afraid of emotions. They just need to understand them and work them. Control them maybe? Uh, well, yes, control them. We need to manage them. Manage them, them. Manage okay. your emotions. Manage your anger. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, sometimes, when I'm really angry, I need to vent. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some people don't think it's that's so helpful, but for me, it's very helpful. You know, sometimes I'm really angry. I'll write an email and not send it, and I'll just <laughs> vent and just get it all out. I just really want to. I mean, it's like wasting time. Mm hmm but it, it helps. Oh, it, it definitely helps. And then you never send an email right. when you're mad. That's no, just, you never yeah. send an email with emotions mm -hmm, in it. Mm -hmm. You know, go at least a phone call, but try to go face to face. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, the positive side, we, you get people caught up in the emotion with you and, and they will follow you, won't they? Emotions are contagious. That's okay. the one thing. I, I have a lot of my clients read the book Primal Leadership or listen to the CDs mm -hmm. because it's so convincing that you start to see that emotions are really contagious. If you come to work happy, people around you tend to be happy. If you come to work and you're negative and you know really down and all that, it spreads very quickly. And they've proven this with little babies, sure. you know. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it's really kind of cool. So we have to be watch, very careful and watch how we act. And, and sometimes it's subconscious because we can walk funny. Yeah. And, and they'll know when something's wrong. Yeah. And we don't have to say a word. That's right. So That's just right. be very, very careful. When we get back, we're going to continue the conversation. And let's talk a little bit about culture and how to build the culture yes. as a leader. Can we do that? Right. Yes. All right. We will be right back. Thanks for watching Inspiring Entrepreneurs with Colonel Lee Ellis, United States Air Force, retired. We'll be right back. Thanks for watching Inspiring Entrepreneurs with Colonel Lee Ellis, United States Air Force, retired. Before the break, I talked a little bit about the commitment card. On the front of it, I read you the quote, but on the back of it, it will help you as a leader because it'll ask you whether you're withdrawing, are you engaging, or are you trying to dominate? Which domination is not just as bad as withdrawing, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> yeah, domination is good in war, but not at work. Okay. Yeah, uh, no one likes to be dominated. No one likes to be over-controlled. Everyone wants to be respected. Domination usually is a result of fear. Okay. The leader who dominates is the leader who's afraid of being out of control or someone else threatening them by being smarter than they are or they're afraid that someone's going to make a mistake, so they try to dominate. So you're saying that people who micromanage and try to dominate are the ones who are micromanaging out of fear? Usually, yes. Okay. They are, uh, as a matter of fact. And I'm, I'm more natural one to dominate because okay. I like to have my way. I believe strongly in my opinions. Uh, I think you see a lot of leaders, the higher up you go, that have that stronger personality and want to dominate. Uh, there's a good thing to wanting to be assertive and initiating. Okay. But when you dominate people, you're really subduing all their talents rather than bringing them out. And you can only do so much. Mm -hmm. So why not give them some freedom, train them, free them, so that they can operate at a higher level, and then you can operate at a higher level as a leader rather than dominate. So the, the secret is to get to that midpoint and engage. Okay. That takes positive emotions. It takes trust. It takes confidence in yourself and in your people. It just takes a more positive attitude. The other, of course, is the withdrawing. Now, some people, if they can't dominate, they will withdraw. Really? Dominant personalities, if they can't control it, they're out of here. Okay. Uh, they check out. They may still be around, but they've checked out. Mentally, they've checked out. Yes, exactly. Their energy is checked out. And if they can, they'll leave. Interesting. So if I'm, I'm somebody who's liked to micromanage my entire life, what would you tell me? Not that I'm that person, but let's just, I know some business owners who are like that. Mm -hmm. They have to control everything. Well, have you stopped to consider the cost? Yeah. You know, what is that really getting you? It may be making you feel safe, but in the end, when you, if you're hiring decent people, you're really undercutting the potential of your organization because you can only do so much. And you're in today's world of information and knowledge, you can only know so much. You should have people around you that know more than you do about this and more than you do about that. And you need to be listening to them mm -hmm. and letting them put make input into the strategy and the tactics and so on uh, because you're limiting your organization to just what you know. And that, that is so true. And then we brought up the, the, the fear word again. Yeah. It, it really is. You know, we, we've talked about the theme of fear throughout this conversation. And I think domination is out of fear from what you're saying. Yeah. Micromanaging is out of fear. Yes. And to you, what is a great culture? Let's get into that a little bit. What would be a great culture to work in? I think a great culture is one where there's a lot of respect, where the leader believes in the power and potential of other people, and that leader learns to, with, to identify that, to develop it, and to kind of draw it out of people. A lot of times as a leader, what I've learned is that people who work for me, they don't see all of their potential and, and their best talents. I can see their talents sometimes better than they can. So my role is to kind of say, you know, you're really good at this. That was really well done. I could have never done it that well. So way to go. So I'm developing them, pulling them out, and then I can release more responsibility to them, more authority to them, because if you're going to give them responsibility, you got to okay. give them some authority. And I feel freer to do that, and it frees me up, and it takes a lot of the worry and stress out of leading uh, away from me when I've got those people around me and all of a sudden I feel like I'm riding on the waves yeah. of all these great people and they're carrying me along and I start to feel like you know how could I be so lucky mm -hmm. suppose they screw up well they will okay we all do, they all do. Yeah. part of that's where a lot of the courage comes in okay. if you're afraid that somebody's going to screw up in your organization uh, that will take you out and will cause you to micromanage so learning to um, 
how much rope to give them and how to train them and then turn them loose. Now, as an instructor pilot for many years, I would take my students up and train them in this high-performance jet airplane, and then I had to get out and turn them loose, and I am making a decision to turn this person loose in a three million, this was back 30 yeah. years ago, <laughs> in a three or four million dollar airplane that they could go kill themselves in and wipe out that airplane. And I have to make that decision to turn them loose. So I think that's a good uh, analogy for leaders is at some point you have to step out of the cockpit and say, you're ready to fly on your own. Go do this on your own. Yeah, you won't do it perfectly, but you probably won't kill yourself. And we'll live through it. And you'll learn and we'll grow through that. And the first time they do it, they're probably scared out of their pants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, what I want them to do is make a mistake and recognize it. And sometimes I want them to say, hey, I learned. I made a mistake. I say, good. Well, what did you learn? Well, they'll tell me. I say, good. So you've, you've grown to the next level. And that's what leaders want to do is they yeah. want their, their team to grow underneath them. Yes, because really we should always be preparing that next generation of leaders. I'm really concerned right now because the people between 45 and 55, the cohort in America, there's a population gap there. Okay. So all of a sudden what's about to happen is the baby boomers are going to go, whoosh, they're going to start peeling out to retire. And so we're going to have to drop down to 45 and below. There's not going to be many between 45 and 60 to pull in. So we're going to drop down and I'm afraid they haven't been prepared. So a big part of my role is helping get the attention of the older leaders to train and develop their younger leaders. Tell them to read your book. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. In fact, that's a big challenge in the introduction to the mm -hmm, book. There is. I yes. say, who's going to develop the next generation of leaders? It could be the current leaders. Yeah, absolutely, from there. Yeah. And, and let's talk a little bit in the, in the little bit of time we have together, talk about building a culture yeah. as a leader. Yeah. You know, some leaders, they shy away from building a culture because they don't want to be held accountable to certain standards and values. But culture is really about the values and the mission, mission and vision to some degree, but it's really also about the values of how we behave here in this organization. You take Southwest Airlines, they have a culture of fun, but they also have a culture of accountability. Mm -hmm. And they go together, put them together very strongly, and it really works. Most great organizations have built a culture. The Marine Corps, IBM, NASCAR, they all have a culture. And I know a lot of small businesses who do, too. Yes. Yeah. And see, when you have a culture, people know how to behave when the boss is not around. But the problem with that is that you, the leader, you have to walk the talk because they're watching you. And mm -hmm. some people are afraid of that because they know they don't behave in the way that they want others to behave. There's a real accountability there when you build a culture. But I tell my people, look, I'm struggling with this just like you are. So if you see a need to call me on something that I'm not living the culture, call me on it. Tell me. I'm, I'm doing my best, but I'm not perfect, so I'll make mistakes, and we'll walk down this road together. Mm -hmm. But that takes, that takes confidence in yourself and courage. And chapter one, going back to the book, is know yourself. Right. Because... I want leaders to know themselves so well on the inside and that they can walk and display that same person on the outside, that they're authentic. They're the same on the outside and the inside so they don't have to worry. They're just being themselves. But it takes a lot of confidence to do that because nobody's perfect. Absolutely. Colonel Ellis, thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. So good being with you today. I'm